this episode of Sentinel Interviews. As you see, we are not in Hasbeans Cafe today because Hasbeans has gone out of business, and maybe we'll talk about that sometime. So Sentinel Interviews is on the road. We're here on the west side of Eureka in the heart of the first ward. Mm. And with me today is Josephine Johnson. And with me today is Charles Douglas. Because actually we're going to turn this on Charles and I'm going to interview him. Because you do all of these interviews with the candidates. Um, you were interviewed for the, the Sunshine Week, um, for that thing with the, the Cable Access Channel, Access Humboldt. Access Humboldt. Access Humboldt. Um, but I don't think that anyone has really interviewed you more in depth, is that true? Not so much lately. Not so much lately. Okay, okay. So I want to know, because I think I represent at least one inquiring mind, I want to know more about you. How did you, why do you do what you do with the Humboldt Sentinel? Tell me what the Humboldt Sentinel is. Just kind of give me your mission statement as Charles Douglas, the, uh, the, the renegade reporter. Is that accurate? Renegade reporter. Vagabond journalist. Okay, that's right. Okay, that's your tagline. Ren okay, renegade reporter, vagabond journalist. I mean, vagabond, it has a intonation of like a hobo hopping the trains or something, but I see vagabond as, you know, somebody who operates outside the sphere of respectability. Because really, the whole craft of journalism, and I call it a craft because they try to professionalize it, they try to make it work. You've got to go to grad school to be a, a bona fide journalist, and you've got to be approved by the system to be a bona fide journalist. And really, the whole craft of journalism sprang up as it, something in opposition to empire. Mm. Uh, in, in America, um, you know, journalism was uh, the patriots, uh, the sons and daughters of liberty, uh, printing their own newspapers uh, uh, at home or, or in, you know, their barn and, you know, putting out, uh, you know, the famous tracks uh, that, that really helped launch the revolution. And, and journalism, I think it was the famous uh, founder of the uh, Chicago Tribune who said the job of a newspaper is to raise hell and how it's been professionalized and in being professionalized Journalists have lost that sense of being ink-stained wretches, of being almost sort of scorned and looked down on by the powers that be, being looked down on by, you know, respectable society. But now, let's be fair, do you not also have a journalism degree from HSU? Uh, no, I, I, I asked... Uh, you wisened up and you decided it wasn't for you. Well, I studied economics and political science at HSU. Oh, um, okay. And, and originally I was a political activist, and anyone with uh, too long of memory I'll remember uh, I would frequently orate at Arcata City Council members, uh, members at the you know regular hearings there. Originally, I was a rep with the student government trying to represent student concerns. On HSU? But yeah, folk from the HSU Associated Students uh, back when I was foolish enough to believe that the student government was there to represent the students and not be this little puppet plaything of the administration, which basically it is. That's why students don't bother to vote in the student elections because they're not electing anybody that does anything for them. You know, little wonder. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I became a, a more radical political activist when I, it became apparent to me that the two-party system was really there to uh, control people and not to really uh, reflect their real needs and real interests. Um, I moved away from became, becoming a rep of the student government to uh, representing uh, you know, more of my own views and more of the views of, the, of a community that was being disenfranchised. Uh, we could see already the effects of NAFTA and GATT and the World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. how it was hollowing out the uh, real industrial base of America and shipping our jobs overseas. So you found that by studying economics and politics that right. that naturally went hand in hand with doing journalism, and, especially and, right. re uh, serious journalism that's on the outside and not necessarily affiliated with like a local publication. You do your own thing, you do your own investigating of things going on, reporting on um, Eureka City Council meetings mm -hmm. and school graduations, things that are very local here to us in Humboldt County for sure. Well, yeah, I, I moved away from politics into media because Why? You know, becoming a student activist and then becoming a more radical local activist, working with the Korean Party, working with uh, human rights organizations, it became apparent to me that a big part of the problem in politics is the media itself and how the media treats uh, the kind of established way of thinking, the so-called conventional wisdom, 
Um, Explain. What do you mean? Tell, tell me. Tell me what you mean. Well, there's the right-wing pro-war party, and there's the left-wing pro-war party. And you feel that most newspapers are either on one in one of those two camps, right? There's well, not much that's in the middle or that is on the outside. Well, they, they treat that as the limits of the acceptable part of the spectrum, and everything else is extremist. Mm -hmm. You're an extreme conservative who thinks the Second Amendment should be respected, or you're an extreme leftist who thinks uh, going to war all over the world isn't necessarily what our framers of the Constitution are really calling for. Um, and so, yeah, it, it it became obvious to me in just looking at even local media bias that, you know, I would try to be getting issues out there and, you know, standing up for folks in front of the city council, in front of the university administration, and the local media would treat activists with disdain. I think it was actually a recent example was uh, John Matthews from Caselug literally said out loud, uh, you know, I, I, don't tr I, don't, I don't trust activists because generally they're dishonest. I mean, he actually said that on live radio. So there's yeah, definitely, yeah. You, you perceive that there's a stigma to being called an activist. But, 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 now let's, but let's look at it too because also up here in this area, activists with the tree sitters, all of the different people who are kind of attracted to a more activist agenda, they do oftentimes, personality-wise, they're kind of on the fringe. They are kind of fanatical. So I can understand why he would say that. So maybe you feel like you are giving the idea of activism like a more... Maybe, maybe you, Charles, are trying to professionalize activism. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was doing anything activism-wise that other folks uh, for years and decades weren't here weren't trying to do. I mean, the Human Rights Commission has been around Humboldt County for decades, the Status of Women Con uh, Commission. Uh, and on the Arcata level, uh, certainly there's been, uh, you know, some courageous stands by the City Council over the years in, in favor of human rights. But more and more I saw Arcata kind of going the same direction as, as Berkeley, where it was this really radical place back in the 60s, but as the hippies became yuppies and the whole place became more gentrified, uh, it became more apparent that uh, they, they were losing that, that sort of drive for being progressive in the best sense of the word, uh, of really trying to evolve human society and becoming more, you know, callous and cold. I mean, and you see Arcata's treatment of the homeless is for oh, example. Of that. Mm, okay, so when you say progressive, what do you mean by a true progressive? What does that mean to you? Because now, yeah. compared to the rest of the United States, especially where I'm from, we live in a very liberal progressive area. We do. I mean, we have we have bike lanes for goodness sakes. I don't think they have those in Indiana. Sure. <laughs> not in most places. I'm sure they do somewhere, but not in my little hometown. I mean, to me, like that's homage to the fact that yeah, bicycles are important. We respect them on the road. So I explain what you mean to me as wow, Arcata. This area has become like as gentrification has happened, we've lost our progressive edge. Explain what you mean. What is progressive to you? And explain what you mean by that. Elaborate. Sorry. Well, progressive to me means, you know, uh, bringing forward the best values of the Enlightenment, bringing forward the best values of science, of humanism. Uh, and I'm not trying to become some advocate of secular humanism and religion is bad or anything like that. Folks can have a variety of spiritual traditions that are either for or against uh, I mean, your answer body. is so progressive. My, um, my folks at home would have no, what are you talking about? <laughs> just speak English, Charles. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just saying, but your answer so far is very progressive. Well, to me, progressive means uh, the Bill of Rights uh, should be interpreted in, in, in the maximum extent to respect human dignity. And uh, we shouldn't have school boards uh, uh, telling kids there are certain scientific facts that shouldn't be told to them. We shouldn't have city councils that pass laws against sitting on the bloody sidewalk, as happened in Arcata in 2001. Uh, we, we've seen real progressive values. Because you feel that that takes away from a progressive society, that takes away from like basic human rights, the basic right to have to assemble wherever you will right. assemble on the sidewalk. Yeah, and, and yeah, and of course, uh, it's not going to apply to the yuppie uh, e eating his uh, sandwich on the front stoop. It's going to apply to, well, people that don't look right, people that look poor, people that look homeless, people that look like they don't belong. Mm -hmm. Well, who determines who belongs or not? Well, it's the money in that pocket. It's how they the appear. Power. Whoever has the power. Exactly. 
And so, yeah, I, I, and again, I, I'm not trying to forward a political agenda here, but I'm just explaining that when I was trying to forward a political agenda, what I ran into constantly was a media that was on the side of the establishment. Mm -hmm. And that's why journalism has devolved from a craft to a profession. Now, if you say it's a profession, well, that sounds more professional. That right, sounds, it does, it does. But, we all but, want to be professional, you know? I mean, But really, it means cozying with the power. It's like, you and I, if you were a, a politician or a business executive, and, and I'm a journalist trying to cozy up to you so you'll be more uh, confessional with me and you'll be a source I can turn to often, that relationship becomes like the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Uh, uh, Stephen Colbert was a rare uh, exception to that when he actually made fun of the president and got booed by his fellow journalists who obviously aren't journalists in the true sense of being independent reporters anymore. But, but to me, it became more and more clear that the media is a big problem uh, in, in terms of in, any sort of social or political progress. Because, because the media, what? Because the media has become part of the establishment. Because, it, because in many instances, it is the mouthpiece. It is that thing that for whomever has the power, they can use that mouthpiece to put forward whatever they want the people to hear. Right. And I'm not, I'm not saying the old days of journalism were some high ideal necessarily. The famous example of Hearst and the, mm -hmm. Cuban, you know, the Spanish American War and the invasion of Cuba. You know, you, you give me the pictures, I'll give you the war. Mm. Um, but at least back then, we had more nakedly partisan press, and we had a greater diversity and a greater number of press outlets where you knew where the Hearst papers stood, but there was also a labor newspaper. The, there were, the newspapers were more out front with their bias. Now okay. they say we're objective, but really means we're objective but, means I'm with the establishment, I'm going to pretend what the establishment wants is what's you know, acceptable. But I would say that there are still many more, I would say there are more outlets today for you know, using your First Amendment rights, right? Uh, anyone can have a blog on the internet and say whatever they want. I mean, uh, maybe it's not like a print newspaper, but there are still many, many ways to get across what your your bias, what it is that you're trying to say. Don't don't you think? I mean, well, that that's exactly where I'm going with this. That that's the in the internet is the hope of media in America today, because we saw in the '80s and '90s newspapers. Uh, the major television networks more and more betray those principles of real real objectivity and real editorial independence. And so the internet has sprung up to fulfill a need that was already there. And because we were already seeing that uh, the newspaper industry and the television networks were consolidating. Mm -hmm. That now six major corporations own over 90% of the major media institutions. Okay, what are those six? So tell me, tell me break that down. Put, tell well, me what I mean, what? Basically, uh, you have Time Warner okay. that owns uh, CNN, and uh, you have Disney that owns ABC. You have Viacom that owns, you know, Comedy Central. Everything from uh, Comedy Central to a big chunk of CBS. You have a few major corporations that have consolidated the ownership, not only of television networks but of the newspapers, of the major radio chains. You know, Clear Channel has uh, snapped up uh, almost a majority of our radio stations in this country. And what was Clear Channel doing in the lead up to the Iraq War? It was basically ordering uh, their local affiliates. Uh, you're not going to cover anti-war voices. And you're not going to play any. Who are those? The 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 Dixie Chicks. The Dixie Chicks. Right. I love them. <laughs> and and it, it's it's astounding. It's it's really astounding how even the so-called liberal mainstream media like NPR, uh, fairness uh, and accuracy in reporting, the Fair Group, mm -hmm. uh, has pointed out that their, if you look at their guest list, it actually skews towards the Pentagon. It skews towards the... When you say guest list for what? What kind of the, event? The folks they interview. The, their sources. The, the people but they don't you feel like they have to kind of like egregiously compensate for that in, on one area? Because they because NPR is also off, so often called you know national proletariat radio or communist mm -hmm. radio. So don't you think in a way they kind of have to skew their numbers? I call it National Petroleum Radio. Look who underwrites those I shows. know, I know. The, the Coke, what is it? The Cox? The Coke? The, the Coke Brothers. Oh, Brothers. yeah. But they're not so much petroleum, but they're definitely big players. Uh, it, it, it's astounding that they're called liberal, but uh, a couple months ago, I, I, I think I turned off NPR's so-called All Things Considered for the last time when I was playing Cages to Cages You, I called All, all Things Censored. They went through this laundry list. Uh, it was the story about Obama announced that he's going to run for re-election, like we didn't know that. But they treated that as a news story, okay. 
and they ran down the <laughs> they ran down the laundry list of potential Republican opponents. Never once did they mention that Obama could face a primary challenge. Remember George Bush Sr. in 92 had a strong primary challenge from Pat Buchanan. Mm -hmm. Not that mm -hmm. Pat Buchanan was so wonderful, but at least he was talking about jobs being shipped overseas. At least he was talking about economic populism and how free trade isn't free for everybody who's getting screwed over. Um, never once did they mention that Obama could face a primary challenger. It's just assumed that you know he will be loved by all Democrats, even though a lot of Democrats like Dennis Kucinich are voting against his new war in Libya that was launched without congressional authorization. And they ran through this laundry list of Republican candidates they didn't mention Ron Paul. Yeah, so, so why? Why wasn't he mentioned? They would, wouldn't mention Ron Paul. They wouldn't mention Gary Johnson, who's a two-term governor of New Mexico. You know, the guy was very well beloved there. He had a balanced budget every year. Uh, as far as the conservative bona fides of being somebody who's fiscally prudent, he's got that. He's also against these endless wars. He's also in favor of uh, decriminalizing marijuana, just like Ron Paul is. So basically, any voice that against the war, against, against the police state, not mentioned. Because Obama and the mainstream Republicans that so-called liberal NPR mentioned, they're all unified on that. Is that even a contest? Vote for Mitt Romney or whoever from the Republicans, or vote to re-elect Obama. More wars, more police state, more bailouts of foreign banks. And any candidates who are against doing all these things aren't even mentioned. And we're not even talking about the bias against third parties. That's just notoriously ridiculous. Okay. How the mainstream media is against them. Even within the corrupt two-party system, you can't mention the voices that are against the war. The more crystal clear example of mainstream media bias. So, so this is my question for you, Charles. You definitely have a deep conviction to getting out the stories and the information um, that it, it is definitely not privileged in the, the two-party controlled media system that we have, right? Right. So, it, it, in effect, you, you kind of, uh, it may or may not matter exactly that you do what, what you do. So, right. why? Why do you continue to do it? Why, why do you do it? Why? Well, that's not for the money. <laughs> <laughs> not for the fame. Yeah, yeah, the fame. And the crystal. And... Somebody called me a public media hero on Facebook the other day. Sweet. I didn't know that. Sweet, sweet. Well, I mean, I think of myself as an anti-hero because, you know, I'm universally scorned by my so-called colleagues. They can't stand the side of me. I was going to ask you, have you ever thought about writing for the Time Standard? I think they're looking for writers. Someone gave They are. <laughs> oh, oh, so yes, I believe so. Have you ever thought about it? I mean, any of the local media here? Well, I, I was a newspaper reporter locally. I was a radio news reporter locally. It's not like I'm against trying to work with the established outlets, but what I found is most of them come under great pressure when they, it's not just about me, but hiring someone like me. If you start being a real investigative journalist, you start reporting on things, even from you just a different perspective. You can interfere with the funding stream, the, ad, the, the advertising revenue. They live on advertising revenue and they live on the approval of the establishment sources and, you know, that, that was a game Rob Barkley was playing with the Time Standard, that he didn't feel like he was being treated with enough deference, so he just won't even talk to them. And then he started that Eureka Reporter, we had that whole newspaper war, and obviously that's over, and Eureka Reporter lost. Uh, you know, I had a certain amount of sympathy for the Eureka Reporter because I thought... It did create jobs for this area. Well, for a and few years... And they had some nice pictures, there were some nice photos in there. Well, I mean, yeah, it was prettier than the Time Standard, but more, <laughs> more to the point, I, I thought they devoted more resources towards covering real local news. Mm -hmm. And I saw articles about subjects appearing there that the Time Standard never touched before. And now that they're gone, the Time Standard's kind of sunk back down into the realm of mediocrity, which is where they were before. The newspaper war competition created uh, better journalism on both sides. And now we're back to the same old situation that, I mean, tiny Eureka is, is a blip. You look at major cities where newspapers are going out of business. Uh, you know, Seattle, uh, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, so many major institutions that have been around for decades, over a century, uh, completely going under. The newspaper industry is collapsing. I know. Um, I know. So, so this, is, this is my question. I, I totally agree with you that the Internet will save journalism. And, and whatever journalism becomes, I think that's a very malleable kind of thing. So 
suddenly anyone and everyone, for the most part, at least in the United States, can have a blog and they can use that to voice their political opinion. They can use that to say what it is that they want to say. And maybe they're like you. Maybe they're going to um, local meetings. Maybe they're going to high school graduations. They're reporting the local news. And that's great. So let's say, like you, they're developing some great content. The challenge is then, how do you get that content out to people? How do you get that out to people so that they know that there is another perspective other than what you're reading in the Time Standard or another major local outlet? Well, that's just it. There's you know 100 blogs about Humboldt County, but who has time to read them all? And most people don't even know about them because there it it's not the the organization. The the internet sprung up and there's this diversity of resources, but mm -hmm. the organization really hasn't developed to where the average local citizen is going to log in online and, and go to a, a, a website that consistently has uh, new news on it. Um, that, that's my hope with uh, what I'm putting on Access Humboldt is I have some regular series on there where it's that time every week, uh, several times a week, you can turn it on and uh, just like you see at you know, Channel 3 News at 6, you can turn on Sentinel Interviews Thursdays at 7 on, on Channel 12 and you can find an interview with a newsmaker in the community and you can get really in-depth conversation like this and find out you know what, what's going on. Um, I, I'd say what's lacking is the resources to make that a part of people's daily habit. Right, because still, even in this country, having internet access, at least in this community, you you have to be above the poverty line. It's I mean, not universal. It, it's not universal. Yeah. And did okay as an addendum, a side thing here. Didn't the UN recently resolve that internet access should be a basic human right? Did I not read that somewhere? I hadn't heard that. Okay, but I should the fact check that. UN but resolution. It's hard to say that as the force of law. <laughs> I know. There's national policy well, saying. Something out of the ether. <laughs> well, there's national policy saying we should have universal broadband access, and, and of course, uh, Sean Lawson from Access Humble can talk your ear off as far as. Uh, the need of rural communities to have uh, to bridge the digital divide mm -hmm. and have broadband access, and you just look at the abhorrent, almost criminal behavior of these major telecom companies, AT and T, Verizon, all name names. Uh, I mean, the, the phone service down in Southern Humboldt, around the Whitethorn area, was spotty or out for days and weeks at a time. Literally, somebody's house burned down, and they couldn't call the fire department. Okay, like because, a physical landline. We're not talking just a cell phone right, line. Profound levels of irresponsibility. Uh, up on the uh, completely the other side of the county around Orleans. Uh, they can't get internet service to save their life. And yet, there is internet service right across the county line in Siskiyou. But because this is Verizon's monopoly zone around Orleans, they can't run a line across, uh, run a, a, an internet line across an imaginary political line to get internet access. Because that would be interfering with the corporate rights of Verizon to sit on their rights and not provide these services. Mm -hmm. And so you have an impoverished community out in Orleans, and you have some company that's basically going to lord over them their monopoly uh, over that area. Oh, and you know, we're not going to provide you internet access because it's not cost effective. It's the internet we're not Nazis. Make, <laughs> right, we're not going to make enough profit off of you, and so yeah, it's not treated like rural electrification in, in the, you know, 30s and 40s. Rural electrification, it wasn't up to the power companies to decide. Oh, we'll give you power if we feel like it. It was a national policy that this is something we have to do to bring everybody into the 20th century. Mm, is to get them electricity. And but I will have to say that grants such an enormous amount of power to internet access because. I, for one, sometimes I just hate the computer. I hate being on it. So I, I oh, you know, I couldn't get on the computer. My internet was down today. Damn AT&T. You know, I, I mean, it's great. It is. It's yeah, great. People, people can misuse it just like anything. Uh, you know, pe people uh, people make more money now on video games than movies. And most of those mm -hmm. video games are incredibly uh, destructive to uh, people's mental health and, and a big time waste. And, and I, I kicked that habit years ago myself, and I can't understand how... People can get so wrapped up in a game and, and neglect their real life. But I guess, I guess in my mind, equating like internet access with rural electrification and the importance of getting electricity to rural areas, I mean, that's that really does add emphasis to the importance of being able to get on the internet. 
So I, well, and kind of pe people's civic involvement, people's mm -hmm. ability to know what's going on mm -hmm. even locally mm -hmm. in their own county. Mm -hmm. Somebody up in Orleans, they have the same rights as a citizen of Humboldt County to know what their board of supervisors is up to as you or I living in Eureka do. But uh, Sutherland Cable goes between Big Lagoon, Blue Lake, and Scotia. It's kind of big bubble around Humboldt Bay. Okay. And, you know, that's nobody's fault. Uh, that's just, you know, the way the, the cookie crumbled as far as the cable franchises. So you got folks up in Willow Creek, uh, up in Orleans. They have no high-speed internet. They have no cable. They're on dial-up still. They're on dial-up internet, and they have no cable television whatsoever. The satellite television companies are, are, frankly, worse than the cable companies in that they have no compunction about providing those public access channels to folks. So, you know, they don't care about providing folks with the local news information from real community channels like, you know, Access Humboldt, 8, 10, 11, and 12. And so, how are they supposed to watch the Board of Supervisors? <laughs> they're I guess, not. They, I guess they, they, drive, not. they drive an hour and a half into town to, to sit with their laptop at a coffee shop and, and watch a they, streaming on, on they, the website. It's, that takes real dedication or some serious OCD. Right. <laughs> and yeah, you're talking about poor people that can barely afford to drive back and forth to get their kids to school. It's not mm. going to happen. And so you got folks who are effectively disenfranchised and cut out of the 21st century and cut out of civic yeah. involvement. All because the bigger companies, the ones with the power, kind of hold it over each other who is going to provide service for these people in rural areas. Right. Wow. And, and that's a perfect example. So the, what do those folks have? They have the newspaper. And if the newspaper, I'm not, I'm not really accusing them of, you know, massive distortions. It's more a mission, more that their parent company, this gigantic media news group conglomerate that's run out of, uh, you know, a billionaire's uh, outfit in Colorado. Actually, that's not even true anymore. Uh, Singleton is going belly up. Dean Singleton, the media baron from the Denver Post. Okay. Basically, the banks. Is it being run from Singapore now? Well, uh, the banks, the the banking conglomerates, uh, have effectively taken receivership of the company. So now, uh, now the banks uh, run the Times Standard and the Oakland Tribune and the San Jose Mercury News and all the other news outlets. Wow. So you wonder why you don't hear about the you know massive criminality of our banking system from the newspapers that have come under the receivership of the banking system. Mm. But, you know, it's not too hard to do the math there. Hmm. You know, I will say, having spent time in in China for almost a year, it's it's amazing to see how the West is portrayed in the media over there. And I'm now being back over here, I mean it's definitely, you know, pro-China, the Chinese are coming, I mean, and, and it's true, the, the economy in China is huge, and definitely in Malaysia, in most of, most of Southeast Asia, the economy is definitely on fire, and the United States is portrayed as being in, in, in economic decline. And here, I will say, being back in the United States, I'm surprised at how little reporting there is in, in local papers, or even really on, like, little national things that I read. Um, that are exploring what's going on, the economic expansion that's happening right now in Asia. I'm surprised because I tell you what, in five years, that's, we will really see the, the impact of that. Ten years from now, for sure, we will see the impact of the Asian economies here on us. We're seeing it now. And, and, so, I mean, and so I find that, that really interesting, knowing that it's more that the banks are controlling our local newspapers. Maybe they just they just want to shield us from the, <laughs> the badness, the, uh, from, shield us from our inevitable decline, maybe? Well, it's, it's what, what do you think about that? It's the inevitable it's, decline of, of mainstream journalism. Mm -hmm. Not just newspapers, but uh, major television networks in this country mm -hmm. have been cutting and cutting their foreign bureaus. Uh, I remember growing up, not that it was so idyllic, but you know, the LA Times had a very strong uh, of foreign uh, world news sections, uh, especially in the Sunday paper. And, you know, even just since when I, I left LA in 95, that's been eviscerated. And you've seen the same thing with the major television networks. They, they, don't, they don't cover foreign news, um, I, I think, in large part because the resources with which they devoted to that have been wiped out. The money and, just isn't there anymore. Well, so and, where, and, and where, why, so where do they... corporate parent. It's okay. not just decline in advertising revenues. It's that the corporate parent wants to suck up more profits to, to pay out to the, the big banks and the bondholders and who are really okay. calling shots. Okay. And they're just getting greedy. There's a lot going on in Asia.
I tell you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm just maybe it's best that we're in the dark about it, but it's definitely they economically they will be powerhouses. But well, that's for example the decline of journalism. We know less about what's going on over there. The average American, uh, you know, can't find France on a freaking map. Uh, and they know that, you know, Charles, they know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in France they know that. Or, or, or in China they know that for sure. But, but yeah, the, the, the same, lazy Americans. <laughs> but the same blackout we're seeing, uh, as far as uh, global news, uh, in our knowledge of it, is happening within local communities. We're seeing local newspapers, local television. I mean, when I was first going to college here, we had three regular nightly news broadcasts, ABC, CBS, NBC. Now that's down to one, and just like the time standard, without competition, it's hard to say that uh, you know the quality standards have gone up with the only one we've got left. And I have to say, I was here when the newspaper wars were going on between the Eureka Reporter and the Time Standard, and right. that was quite fun. I enjoyed that, sure reading that. the stories, and I, definitely the journalism was fun. The, the competition bred uh, uh, more of a sense of excellence mm -hmm. and more of a sense of, you know, we, we had better disclose this or the other guy as well. But now you have these one-horse towns or these no-horse towns. And it's up to what some blog to cover what's going on. Some blog that probably most local folks, uh, you know, aren't reading because they don't have internet. Because they don't have the or, internet, right? Or they, they and then just... how do you vet a blog? Like how do you? So if everyone, so that that's kind of the thing with newspaper um, and traditional media. There's kind of like this sense of oh right, here's the newspaper, it is the authority. If anybody can have a blog and write whatever it is that they want to write, how do you vet that? And how do you? How does the community then figure out what is a credible source in terms of an alternative media source? Well, that's that's difficult. I, I mean, blogs are still subject to the same legal sanctions okay. as newspapers. Okay. Uh, we saw there was a local notorious blog called Above the Law that I was really. I've heard mention of this. There was a what one pack of local Eureka police officers um, saying the most outrageously libelous, uh, defamatory things about the police chief. All anonymously. Chief. Right. Well, oh. supposedly anonymously, but then you track that, can't there was a well. There's a court case, and the whole thing came out, and it was uh, you know this one dispatcher who was dissatisfied with the police chief, now ex police chief Gar Nielsen, and <laughs> the changes he was trying to bring to the department. And yeah, she lost, and she had to pay out. Uh, I think it was ten thousand dollars to this other officer. But why should we care about this, other than like the inherent soap opera factor that I find interesting? Why should we care? Why should someone outside of town, you know, technically close to Eureka, but who may or may not have internet access, why should they care about these local goings on? Why? Well, police corruption. I mean, if you don't live in Eureka, you might visit Eureka. You don't want to be shot. You don't want to be pulled <laughs> over and shut down. You don't want to be... You don't want to see your... It's still your tax dollars if you shop in Eureka. That's your sales tax money. Going to City Hall. Going to the police department. So, you still have a vested interest to see that public resources are spent appropriately. And you want the police, like the POP team, the problem-oriented police, and you want them taking down drug houses. You want them going after prostitution rings. You want them fulfilling their mandate to mm -hmm. serve and protect. You don't want them uh, lazing around, uh, making massive amounts of uncalled for overtime, forming SWAT teams so they can, you know, play out these, you know, violent war games. But and then, but then, but then, if you have a, if you have a blog, and if anyone can say whatever it is they want to say. How does the average person, oh, I got me my internet and I'm out here on the homestead, solar powered, of course. Right. How does the average person then discern what, what, what the real news is, what the scoop is, as opposed to like the, 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 the fractious, libelous stuff that is often on the internet? Well, that, that's the one thing the, the internet needs to do. Uh, institutions on the internet, you can't blame the internet. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You blame the airwaves or something. But that's one thing that internet media institutions... And, and you know, I'll po point the finger myself. Ne need to do a better job of is bringing the disparate, independent uh, media makers together, and really forming some sort of collaborative, collective sense of the community. You can't produce quality journalism perpetually for free. You do have to come up with some sort of revenue model to pay for this to happen. And with the collapse of the old newspaper advertising model, and now you're seeing even the viewership of cable television news, even that on a national level is collapsing. Mm -hmm. Even Mighty Fox, even CNN, going downhill just like the newspapers were a few years ago. 
And so where's the money going to come from? It can't all be produced for free forever. I pride myself in being a starter being a journalist, but at some point, people out there are going to have to decide, uh, is it going to be a PBS model? Are you going to pay for the kind of journalism you want to see, or do you want to not be informed about what's going on at a local level? People have to really look in the mirror and make that determination. Oh, is ignorance bliss? That's the question. Wow. So how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you fund the things that you do? How do you do what you do? Well, not very well. But, but, but you do. You do do it. You do these series of interviews. Um, what about Access Humble? I mean, isn't that a great resource for people who want to... I mean, it, it's a great resource in many respects for learning video, editing, video shooting, but also it empowers you. It's a community resource that empowers you to go out and be that community watchdog. It's right? been very empowering for me. And, and I've, I've got a foot in both worlds now because I do... Uh, do some on-call uh, work for them, uh, uh, doing some uh, media production, and so I don't want to speak for them because you know there's higher ups and that's their job. Mm -hmm. So so I don't want to be a cheerleader for Access Humble here in, in an official capacity. I want to make that clear. Um, but I came in Access Humble originally not as an employee, but as an independent producer, and I still got a foot firmly planted in that world, and I still want to bring in other folks in that independent production work. And it's, it's been amazing. I've been able to reach more people making television shows in the space of a year and a half than I, I did on a, a website in, in three times that amount of time. And why? Why? Just because um, it's, a, it, it's a more engaging medium, you think? What well, you I, I mean, one of the longer term problems we're facing is that I think uh, literate culture has gone into decline. <laughs> and, We've become a, yes, it has. We've become a society that reads less and watches more. And I, I'm very much against... We were talking about that book, The Typographic Mind, and how in the 19th century people were more inclined to sit and listen and they would read more, and it was definitely a much more language-focused kind of culture now. Now, oh. guide, now guide to board, society the spectacle. We've become a uh, society yeah. infected by delusion and by unreality. Uh, a more recent example, obviously, Guy to Board wrote that decades ago, is uh, Chris Hedges' Empire of Illusion. Okay. That we, we've become immersed in this propaganda matrix where things that are completely unreal and ridiculous, uh, anything from professional sports to you know wrestling to celebrity culture, that becomes more important to people. I know, that's our news. That's our news. Right. Can, I, can I just share this with you? When I was, when I was in China... The whole, when, when, when there was the controversy with where Barack Obama was, was born and the, what they call themselves, the birthers? Or? Well, that's what they were called. I don't know. Okay, I don't know, I don't know, but in the China Daily, I put this on the internet, in the China Daily, that made the newspapers, and it was so very embarrassing. And the photo that they ran with that story was an image of Barack Obama and Michelle Obama on the Oprah Winfrey show talking about where he was born. And I mean, and, and like the subtext of that in China is like, hello America, you are in economic decline and you're, you're worried about where your president was born? Oh my gosh. I mean, right. it, it played very, it was embarrassing. I was embarrassed. So that ties into that idea of celebrity culture yeah. being much more important than, yeah, I mean, to me to think that Donald Trump just hijacked the national attention and got our, our attention away from far more important things, I just... I just want to shave his head, you know, <laughs> get rid of his bad hair. But um, I think that's one example of how the United States is kind of portrayed in foreign media, and it speaks to the idea of how most Americans, um, it's entertainment and celebrity culture that is much more newsworthy and important than our local goings on or right. what's going on. I don't blame foreign media or China or anyone else for that. No. Those are, these are self inflicted wounds. <laughs> yeah. These are self inflicted wounds that are murdering our own intellectual heritage. <laughs> I mean, any of the founding fathers we're profoundly embarrassed. They're rolling right now. Big time. Because what what if we fight a revolution for for people to have the right to be Slurpy big gulps. <laughs> right, so people to be perpetually have the right to, to be distracted and, and just live in this uh, matrix of unreality and uh, pulp. I mean, it's free speech. You have the right to say these things. 
but do you have the right to completely dominate the media landscape with garbage? With frivolous, with crap. That's my question. Why doesn't KHSU have a news program? Why is there not a news program on that public radio station? I would love to know, because they raise buckets of money, way more than KMUD, and yet tiny little KMUD in impoverished Southern Humboldt can cough up a weeknight, half-hour local news program. Week? Yes, every night. Every, every weeknight. That's and, nice. And, you know, it's, it's quality. Uh, I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll spend 10 minutes talk, talking about one tree getting cut down in downtown Garberville. They can get a little parochial sometimes, but, but I really respect Terry Clemenson and, and the work she does there and, and uh, the other, you know, screener reporters that really do survive on the tree screen for doing what they do. And yeah, KHSU thinks it's more important to shovel buckets of money into the gaping maw of National Public Radio. So they can give us this more this vanilla but now, sanitized. I know, but, but now let, let's be fair. They did. They have. They have had some programming um, things that they have made changes to. Right? There's no longer uh, Prairie Home Companion and no more Mountain Stage. I, I think they were going to get rid of Prairie Home Companion, <clears throat> but then they renegotiated their you know brinksmanship cancellation of it, and now it's it's going to keep going. Okay, so will you? Tell Not me that that's that important, really. That's you know. But but it does make it. But it does open up places in their budget, and right. wouldn't it feasibly also create a space for a local, a locally produced program? Well, I think they made some of these changes to save money. They also got rid of the overnight BBC programming. And, uh, and I think Ed or somebody in the paper said, you know, there's only one or two hundred listeners of that, you know, at midnight or three in the morning, so is it worth Oh, there are far more insomniacs in this town than that. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's one of the only sounds I've turned on cages. It, yeah, you know, it's, I yeah, can, yeah. I like because, the little, like, beeping sound. I've, I've, I've definitely turned into the... Well, I mean, BBC. and BBC, yeah, it's government-controlled, and, it, and it's got its own bias in favor of, you know, the British imperial system, but, it, but at least it's providing some greater detail of coverage of foreign events that you're not getting mm -hmm. in NPR, certainly. It's definitely a different perspective. Well, so I, I have a question for you. Two of my students that I work with in China, they want to come to HSU and they want to study journalism. Great. I know, right? I, I thought all the Chinese students were coming here to study business. Many of them are. Most of them do. But a few of them, I have, I have some creative writers and some creative artists that I work with. So, now, you know, journalism in America is very different from journalism in China. Yeah, uh, they have journalism? Well, well, yes, but it's more, yes, I know. It's, it's propaganda, and they will not lie about the fact that it's propaganda. I mean, it's very, look on the positive side of all the development, hey, okay, right? I mean, it's always, there's always a positive spin to it. Right. But so, what would you say, like, to my students who are coming over to study journalism, and then also to students who are wanting to study journalism now, what, what would you have to say to them? You've been doing this for a while as, a, as a, an extreme, independent, I will not say activist, but you are the independent of independent news people. Viciously independent. Yeah. And why, why would you advocate that? Why would you advocate that kind of journalism to my students coming over, which is kind of what I advocate too, but you know, being in China, I had to be very careful about how I advocated that. So. How would you do it? Why would you do it? And then why would you also advocate that kind of journalism to native people here? Yeah, why would I advocate it to anyone? Because <laughs> right. life is short. Life is short, people. In a blink of an eye, you're going to be 50 and 70 and 90, and then you'll be in the grave. And, and you'll be at Access Humboldt. You'll be editing video film footage, yeah, right? Big <laughs> keel over right there in the terminal. Right? Life is short, and if your life is to have any meaning at all, at least if my life is to have any meaning at all, it's about standing up for the values that my ancestors fought and died for. I've had relatives that fought in World War II. My grandfather, I mean, built one of the five weapons that Dwight D. Eisenhower said won World War II. And, you know, I've had relatives going back to the Revolutionary War in America. Did they fight to uh, break away from the empire and found what they hoped would be a democratic republic, however imperfect? just so we can succumb to the same uh, forces of uh, imperialism and tyranny. Um, it's, it's a travesty. And certainly in, in Asian cultures, uh, I'm, I don't consider myself an expert. I didn't go there for a year like you did, but I know enough to know I'm that... I'm not an expert either. I, I know enough to know <laughs> that honoring their ancestors is something that they say is important to them and culturally is, is 
part, is part of their center of who they think they are. Well, did my ancestors toil for freedom so that I can watch it be torn away from our country and I would not only do nothing about it, I would become a stenographer for power and, and like these little mainstream media weasels who suck up to the people in charge and cheerlead the destruction of our economy and the destruction of our freedoms and don't say a word when Obama reauthorizes the Patriot Act, as you mentioned one of your recent pieces. I mean, do these values that we all pledge allegiance to, does liberty and justice for all, do, do we really mean that? Or is that just some empty phrase like, you know, saying you believe uh, in, in whatever you say, you believe in a church, and, and that happens for an hour on Sunday, and then you go back to being a jerk. You know, that's not real religion, and it's not real democracy, and it's not real journalism, to say we believe in liberty and justice, and then underwrite tyranny and oppression. Uh, you and know. you feel like you get away from underwriting tyranny and, and oppression by being vagabond journalists, by doing the thing that is the, the thing that it is that you do. Do I want to have integrity or not? Do I want to have a life that has real human values and meanings or not? Do I want to have a family someday and leave behind a world that I've at least tried to make better? Or do I want to just be a little toady to you know the people in charge who, who are vacuuming up all the wealth and turning us into the same kind of neo-feudalistic oligarchy that we supposedly left the old world to get away from. Um, neo-feudalist oligarchy? Yeah. That's pretty well put. That's what's going Can on. Can I quote you on that? I'm, been, I'm getting quoted on that. <laughs> well, do you, do you have anything else you want, you want to say about journalism, about you, about... Um, Independent journalism is the journalism. All, all the other stuff is propaganda and public relations and just... It reminds me of like alternative music in the 90s. You right. know, like there was alternative music and then suddenly like, now we have all these alternative radio stations and then alternative became mainstream. So it's kind of, it's right. constantly this thing that is on the bottom that, you know, as soon as you flip it to the top, then it becomes the paradigm that needs to be opposed again. So Sure. You're districting. Yeah, I'm, I'm tripping over wow. my words. Real quick, so I, this thought is my I, was, last question. I thought I was the politics nerd. Okay, I know, I know. This, this, is, this is my last question. What, what do you think about this whole, how the lines for the wards are drawn here in Eureka and how that whole thing works or doesn't work? Ooh, you're bringing up a sensitive I, subject. Am I? Should, should, do you not want to answer that? Well, I can answer it this way, that the state, um, through a couple of different ballot initiatives that we the people did pass in our finite or infinite wisdom. And how long ago was that? Um, they passed a more recent one last year, and okay. there was another one a couple years before that. And the the first one took the power of redistricting the state legislative lines, the lines of our 80 assembly and 40 state senate districts. Okay. Out of the hands of the legislatures themselves, because mm -hmm. politicians draw their own line to give themselves safe seats that they always get reelected from, and put it in the hands of what they call the Citizens Redistricting Commission. Which is appointed. Which is stacked, I'm sure. Which is appointed in a somewhat convoluted <laughs> way, and the way it turned out, there's only one <coughs> member of that commission who lives north of the San Francisco Sacramento line in Yellow County, where Davis is. Okay. So that's our closest rep in the so-called Citizens Registering Commission, is hundreds of miles away. So the way it's kind of come together is a little weird, not optimal, but at least it's not the legislators themselves drawing their own lines. And then this later initiative added the congressional districts. California okay. has, uh, you know, 53 congressmen and women in the U.S. House of Representatives. And so this commission all also now has the power to draw those lines. And so every 10 years, we have a census, and the census figures come back. And then the year after that, and here we are in 2011, they got to redraw all these lines because the populations have shifted. Mm -hmm. uh, California, obviously, the big growth areas are places like Riverside and San Bernardino and the Central Valley. And so those districts... Physically, if you look on a map, actually have to shrink. And the places that haven't grown have to grow because the districts have to be relatively equal population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here in Humboldt County, Fortuna and McKinleyville have grown somewhat, and Eureka and Arcata haven't. And so our Eureka Supervisorial District has to grow a bit. The one from Southern Humboldt and Northern Humboldt have to shrink a bit, a bit and so forth. Here in Eureka, we haven't had major population shifts in the last 10 years, but according to the information I've been researching, they didn't redraw the words 10 years ago. They didn't redraw the words 20 years ago. The words, the five words we have in Eureka 
Those lines haven't changed for a couple of decades now. Okay, 30, 40 years? And uh, I still have to research exactly when. Um, okay. And But it's it's <coughs> been a long time, longer than I've lived in Humboldt County. I've been here since 95. It hasn't you need, you need to make a blog post on this. I, because, because the bigger mess <laughs> is, the bigger mess is then... These people are elected, you know, people who run for the for the wards. Right. You run for a specific ward, but the whole city gets to vote for that person that's running for that one ward, and the people voting for that person in the ward may or may not live in that ward. So well, 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 the council and, and, members are required to live in the right, ward. right, right, right. But the people, but the voters who are voting citywide right. may or may not live in that ward. Well, in which, four four fifths of them don't, by definition. Right. Right, 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 right. And it's a weird system. Do I get to elect the members, uh, do I get to elect the congressional district uh, representative from Orange County? No. no. Do I get to elect the state assembly member uh, who represents, uh, you know, Bakersfield? No, no, no and I so, see the statewide for, you know. And so if districts, each district votes for its own representative, why, why does uh, Lumbar Hills, why does Pine Hill, why does Henderson Center get to elect my work? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I agree. And most cities in California do not operate this way. Either you have at-large elections or you have district elections. And in fact, uh, local governments in California and elsewhere have been sued and usually lose or usually just agree to give up um, if they have a gerrymandered sort of election systems where minorities don't receive adequate representation. There's a famous example, I think a city somewhere in the East Bay area where there was a very strong Latino population and they never had a single member of their community ever on the city council. Uh, Look at Fortuna. They have at-large elections. There's no like hybrid ward at-large system like Eureka. It's just splayed out. Five seats, three are up one year, two are up another year. Okay, it's the same way. They have, I think, over 20% of the city Latino now after the last census. I'll have to double check that, but it's around 20%. In Fortuna. In Fortuna. Um, look at that city council. It's pretty white. It's yeah, I don't know. I don't know the members of the city council down there. So do you have, do you have anything else you'd like to say before we, we wrap up this wonderful afternoon of talk and question? Yeah. Wow. Making me talk a lot. I don't know if this is such a good idea. I think it was a great yeah. idea. This has been quite fun, I think. No, no, I, I'm, it's lots of fun for me. But, you know, I, I can talk about myself all day. I'm good at that. But, 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 but I mean, uh, but usually I, I'm, I'm you're sure the, I've, I'm sure I've offended the, somebody. Uh, I, 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 of course you have. <laughs> but usually uh, you're the one doing the interviewing. So right. this this is your opportunity to... Well, this is I your like idea. You. I want that on the record. Okay, it was my idea. This was my idea. It's true. It is true. And, I mean, I guess it's cool that, you know, the tables can get turned on me. Um, but my message to the people out there is that, uh, you know, the power is in your hands. Start a blog. Yeah. Start your own TV show. Get yourself <laughs> on Channel 12. Get yourself on YouTube. That's my message to them is that this isn't rocket science. It just takes a bit of dedication and a bit of concern for the future community to want to not just get involved in charity work, uh, and I'm not criticizing for one moment the folks out there feeding the homeless or uh, the folks from Keep Your Eat Beautiful or planting street trees or all sorts of so many wonderful things going on that people really care in this community, and I have absolute respect for them. But I feel like the segment of nonprofit, you know, philanthropic sort of work that gets neglected, I think the public non-commercial media is a big part of that, uh, of that which is, I think, neglected. Because people don't see that as so much directly a service to people in the same way, giving food to the, you know, the starving uh, homeless folks. And so you're saying if there's a collective of people who are, let's say, part of Access Humble, and they want to come together and they just want to, um, you know, we're going to go and document my neighbor changing his oil, talking about changing his oil, like, I don't know, something where you've got some people together reporting on the local goings on in their neighborhood. Br bringing, bringing the... My neighbor changing his oil is not news, I realize that. Well, bringing the real, real local stories to people, uh, it, that could be one example, but any one of the examples we've talked about, if you're not going to do it, who is? Mm. And if you're not going to be satisfied with 
the, the pulp the mainstream media feeds us and you want to do something different. You know, even if you don't want to be the one holding the camera yourself, uh, at least try to support the folks that are trying to build a new model of the media that doesn't rely on advertisers with a political agenda, that doesn't rely on government funding. Um, if, if you want to expect more of the media, then you, we, the people, need to get engaged to make that happen. Mm -hmm. We can't sit around and wait for Access Humble, or wait for PBS, or wait for anyone uh, to come save us. Uh, we need to be the media that we want to see. Ooh, well put. Charles, you are the media that we need to see. Well, thank you, Josephine. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for talking with me this afternoon. You bet. So were you told you couldn't let your children play? Yeah, gave me a ticket to boot. I don't know what. I 